Hey, welcome everyone. We are so glad you're with us today to talk strategies and tools for contract training. And some of you are even joining us over your spring break. Is that dedication or what? It's going to be a fun session today. We have an expert in continuing ed and workforce development with us, going to talk about some sales strategies, and then I'm going to share tools that you have available in your system once that sale is finalized. Yep, that's me, not Chuck. He wasn't able to join us today. Don't, don't everybody leave the room, please. And Trenton and I want you to get the most from today, so drop your comments into the Q&A or chat, and uh, Cheryl and I are going to keep an eye on that. And I am so glad Trenton's with us today from Santa Fe College in Gainesville, Florida. I mentioned earlier that I envy him because winter has returned to Kansas. We're going to learn a lot from him, from his 25 years in continuing education and workforce training and sales experience. And Trenton, we so appreciate that you're sharing your time with us today, and I am turning things over to you. Well, I thank you very much. I'm looking forward to an opportunity to share some ideas. Actually, this uh, program has been um, offered since 1996, I've been doing strategic sales for colleges. And my first job, actually, um, at Finger Lakes Community College, which we were just talking about up in upstate New York. And I had a, a great opportunity. I was hired as a marketing training coordinator. I got promoted to manager in about two years. Um, I took over an operation that was actually losing money. Um, it was losing about, about $250,000 a year. And um, I broke even by the third year and actually was generating uh, about half a million dollars in revenue uh, by the sixth year um, when I left and went to Frederick Community College um, as, a, as a director. And I was promoted to associate vice president within two years and did a similar turnaround um, with a full continuing education division. Um, and most of our growth came from customized training, going from about 1,000 students in customized training to about 8,000 when I left about seven years later. It uh, was great uh, opportunity to keep learning and applying the principles um, in Virginia, where I served as the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Workforce Development. And one of the um, aspects for the state of Virginia that when I was hired was to help share strategic sales for colleges and help build up corporate training initiatives for the state of Virginia. And so I was able to do that um, with 23 community colleges and provide this training as other um, tools and, and menus and using other national tools like um, uh, different programs to help third-party vendors bring in those resources to help grow sales. And so that's what I really hung my hat onto, um, knocking out my master's in administration of higher education and my doctorate in organizational leadership, which really rounded out doing corporate training. And there's some real secrets to the consulting world that people try to use sometimes that we can um, talk about in success too as well. So first thing I'll ask is to make sure you can see my screen. Is that true? That is true. Because I have it on PowerPoint, I don't see anything else but my PowerPoint in front of me. And um, for technology purposes, you're probably seeing just my PowerPoint today, but I'll show you just a, a real quick picture of me of today versus when I started this business in 1992. So I'm an old timer before cell phones. And um, I thought when we got the fax machine, it was an amazing sales tool, so I could not have to mail uh, or drive a contract to a client. Um, you could you could use the machine to do that. Now today, the tools with virtual sales and virtual online corporate training and different ways you can mix and match uh, using third-party vendors is pretty amazing. Um, the introduction is kind of clear and right now in that we've just had an introduction from Aceware. Uh, we're gonna talk about in context how that works. Um, thinking about data collection, information collection, and how you move your customers forward. Uh, the key thing, though, is really defining your customers, talking about tools and techniques for sales with your proposals and your planning for the whole process, and then um, some discussions for preparation. That's today's outline for today. Our objectives are the ideas that we're trying to think about how does sales work today? How does virtual sales work today? We were actually even combing this program during COVID to even talk about doing virtual sales and doing a little more um, kind of selling through 
a Teams meeting where you maybe even drive to the customer site. Um, defining your customer is key in developing common language between what the society or human resource manager, SHRM uses, or the American talent development. Um, at Santa Fe College, where I've landed recently, I took over an operation and a community college initiative that has an Aspen award-winning academic work. Uh, they're an amazing um, institution in Florida that I hadn't heard of in uh, my 30 years of travel through community colleges. Uh, they basically spent their time in academics. They didn't have a great initiative in um, continuing ed and contest customized training. And so I've been able to actually do a full startup. So I've been able to use all the tools that I've been teaching over the years and even do a full startup. Um, I can, I'm proud to say in the first year, we've already sold $100,000 in customized training in a small rural area of Gainesville, Florida, um, just two counties. And it's um, a pretty difficult community with some of its work, but uh, it does have the University of Florida there and that helps the economy. We're gonna talk a little bit about how we're implementing some of those strategies there and how we're able to make a difference for um, some of their strategies. I've worked with uh, the NCCT board. I've been on the Learn Leadership Council and had a great opportunity to learn from a great uh, group of individuals across the country. And uh, I'm excited to share with you a little bit today about uh, sales and the context of higher education. I think the key is um, why would an employer want to offer training at the college, with the college, near the college? There's a mental capacity that we all forget about that, that is in the minds of each one of the people we meet with. Most of them are college graduates, or university graduates. Um, during your first calls and appointments, it can become in the back of their mind or subliminal uh, that they went to college, that they went to university. You know, sometimes I think we forget about that subliminal message that's in their mind about what their experience was in college um, or university. And we're there saying to them, hey, we got something different. No, we'll do corporate training for you. Um, you won't be lectured to. You won't be um, put into a classroom with chairs. We have a professional environment for you. I think that we lose track of that sometimes, that subliminal message that's in the back of their minds. When, it, when it, a training manager, an HR manager, or a CEO is making a decision about training, there's a lot going on in their minds about their business, their operations. And training is important and it's urgent when it's needed or required. And so that is probably some of the psychology of uh, mindset that we have to keep in mind when we're trying to help them overcome. They don't wanna be embarrassed when the students don't like the experience. They don't wanna be embarrassed when the HR manager hires you and, and the CEO hears the training wasn't good. They're willing to pay more for that amazing experience or that the students won't complain or won't feel um, differently treated than a college experience. That's one of the things I think that we all overlook. Sometimes we just go meet with people and we're trying to provide community. The, the nice thing is that we are always promoting the facets of what we do at a community college or a university. We're always talking about these principles uh, that enhance workforce, grow leadership. Uh, the term that we're using though today is talent development. Um, I'll be happy to share flyers and information with you that we already put together uh, with Santa Fe College. And we're actually referred to ourselves as the Customized Training Initiative. And also, our, we actually refer to ourselves as talent development. The two hot words for SHRM and the ATD group, American Talent and Development, which used to be ASTD, the American Society Training and Development. They now go by ATD, American uh, Talent Development. Uh, the fact is that those are the verbiage and the terms they're used to hearing. These words that we use sometimes are confusing to workforce, uh, economic development, lifelong learning. In the eyes of the business individuals, they just need training for a certain spec requirement or something that they're planning for, and that's important to them. To make sure that I'm not missing a question, and now Sharon, let me know if the question does come up, please. So, Absolutely. so building a relationship as a community is important, but I just want to talk about that beginning before I start getting into the specific tools. Um, reasons why the employers are hiring us is really talent development and talent recruitment today more than anything else. They're trying to retain their employees. They're trying to um, uh, use this as an aid to recruit 
and differentiate themselves from other individuals. And you'll see those organizations like Wegmans or Disney that provide um, tuition reimbursement, even to part-time employees today. Why? Because a community college student is 30 years old. Why? Because they're gonna spend six years getting that degree and you've got yourself a, a great employee for the next six to eight years while you also have them on tuition reimbursement for their, their work. They're, that's part of the whole process that's going on. These are the motivators behind why they're going to buy that training from you and think about what they're building for their organization. These are the key things you want to ask questions about in the beginning and the deadly um, beginning that we'll talk about, the four steps of this process for you meeting with a customer. And during a two-day session that I've provided literally in over 23 different states and statewide agreements with uh, statewide training initiatives, um, we'll talk about the same thing. It's an open, where you open the discussion, questioning, where you ask questions. I'm gonna show you this in another slide and you'll get a copy of this slide as well. And then evidence, and then next step. So there's really four steps in the process. It's not rocket science, opening, questioning, evidence, and next step. The dangerous spot for us is that um, the comfort zone for us is to talk about what we do and who the college is and what we do with the college. And clients for the first calls that you make, if you're making a brand new call and even if a college a company has called you for the first time and you're meeting with them, the first thing they're going to say is, I'm glad you're here. Tell me what you can do for me. And you really haven't earned the right to, to go into all the details about what the college could do with its 300 faculty members and 200 credit courses and 500 certification courses and your 200 community education continuing ed certification courses. You really need to go through a questioning phase first. It's uh, the response to, I'm glad you're here. Tell me what you can do for me. The, the number one response is, I can't wait to tell you. Tell me more about your organization. I can't wait to tell you about the college. We've been here for 50 years serving the community and doing this kind of work for customized training and talent development. Tell me what's going on at your company right now. It is about reflecting it back to them and letting them be the first one to speak. This is the step that most of us skip in sales with customized training or talent development training. We don't think ourselves as um, the experts in assessment. We need a consultant to come in. We're going to, you're going to have to wait. We're going to bring somebody in. You're going to meet the instructor. They're going to do, they're going to meet with your team and figure out the strategies for the training. We're going to customize this to your specific needs. Let's wait till the instructor can get with you. Keep in mind that you're competing against consultants in the community that are meeting face-to-face -face with that client saying, I'm here. I can do the assessment and I'm ready to book it right now with complete confidence, no doubt in their mind. There's not a slip of confusion about that HR manager or training manager hiring that consultant. She is here in front of me. She is confident. She is ready to start and give me some dates. Uh, when we come in sometimes as a third party initiative with consultants as adjuncts, we have a tendency to say, wait till you meet with the instructor. We're gonna bring somebody in and introduce you to somebody. Um, they're looking for someone to take charge and that's us right now. You're there with them. I want to show you the six step process we go through that you actually sell the client. You don't sell them training and development. You're going to sell them a six step process. It's consultation, assessment, build the training, training begins, evaluation, follow up. These are the six steps that I'll show you in another slide that you share with the customer. They're going to go through this process with you. But let's focus on assessment first. You have full authority to provide informal assessments. Some of you may already do that. As anybody, and if you can, um, you can make a comment in the comment box. Have you provided an informal assessment for a customer or some other business action or other planning initiative that you've gone through? Hey, folks, or raise your hand and I can take a look. Have you done this before? Oh, I'm not. Um, I do see somebody, Sandy. Sandy Elliott has her hand up that this has been done before. Thank you, Sandy. CCBC?
can she speak or is she just making a comment in the chat? Here comes the chat. Yes. All the time. She raised her hand for that, that, that they have done that. Yeah, very good. Absolutely. So this is where you actually meet with the client. You're meeting one-on-one -on -one in that consultation set. I'm going to show you the six steps process you sell them. You're not selling them a training class. You're not selling them one, one situation. You're actually selling them um, the opportunity to think about this whole process of um, the informal assessment. So when you're sitting with the HR manager or a training manager or a team, and you're listing what they say they're interested in learning, if it's a computer class like Excel, what are the points about tabs or, or what is it they wanna learn about Excel? If they talk about team building, like communication skills, problem solving, um, dealing with difficult people, communications, you are, you are now fully capable of putting together um, a, a survey that you can send out to the individuals that are gonna participate in the class. You're gonna ask them during that meeting, even in this consultation session, if I give you the assessment, will you give it to the students and give it back to me? Will you um, also give me the, the data and information for our instructor to be able to review so we can help customize this session and emphasize certain parts of it, whether you're using a third party vendor or you're using your own content that you're building for them. So you have full permission to provide an informal assessment. If you can convince a customer to take advantage of an informal assessment, they're very serious about the training and they're very serious about you doing that. You can also request, can I meet with them and just flip chart and or do a team's meeting with them to get their ideas and, and ask them their own input for the training session. This, this is part of the process in the first meeting with somebody that says they're interested in training. If you can do an informal assessment for them, they're going to, they're very serious. They're looking at you and they're giving very serious thought to you doing that. You also warn the students okay, or let the students know and get them involved in the training so that when your supervisor training comes in or, or your person for technology comes in to train them in some certification, they've actually been a part of building the class. They can remember, hey, I filled out the assessment to help build this class. I was involved with the process and I knew this training was coming versus setting the company setting up training and each of, the each of the students feeling like they're not sure that they need to be attending this. This training isn't for me, it's for somebody else. So this, this is a great informal assessment process that helps your customer do that. I'm gonna show you in the six step process where this fits in, but I wanna make sure you know you have full authority to create informal assessments, collect information for one, giving to the instructor so they can customize the course. Two, warning the students how, or giving the students good formal um, notice that training is coming and they've got the chance to be a part of that. Three, you can ask to meet with the client, the students and um, or the potential participants and help be able to be able to form the class and get more engaged with that, that organization. That's an informal assessment. Now there are normed assessments that you can use as well. Normed assessments you may find even in the front of some of the computer training guides that help you um, determine whether they're ready for um, awareness, learning and practicing or mastery. And sometimes in the computer, we call it intro, intermediate or advanced. You can use the formal assessment tool that's in that manual to help them fill that out and know which part of the um, program they should be attending for which level. There's also Myers-Briggs and DISC, and um, there's also other uh, tactical skills like uh, work keys that can give you other formed data that will help you with the training process. You can get those tools and, and have those implemented in your training process. They've been normed. They've also would probably stand in court if, if, if uh, questioned in some way. Um, that's what I mean by a formal assessment versus an informal assessment. So we're trying to find out which one of those tools we're gonna use. This is a really important step that a lot of uh, training managers directors of customized training, deans of customized training, be, don't, don't feel like they should be involved in this process. But if you do it informally, you're really part of the um, buying selling process and you're getting your customer moved along. This of course is the DISC, um, the D, I, S, and C, uh, dominant influence, uh, conscientious and steadiness. Love this tool. I love to uh, front end this with almost any training that I do as well. Um, I personally would do some, I'm personally at Clay Electric in Santa Fe right now and 
Alachua County providing this training with DISC and supervisory skills training that's uh, online and uh, six hours in classroom. I, I, I did a, a combination where use, I'm using one of our third party vendors supervisory skills courses. I'm using DISC as the tool to help measure the behaviors in, in classroom participation. Introverts and extroverts learn differently. I actually outsold one of the universities in my community because I was able to offer them uh, an in-classroom session for two hours, 24 hours online, and a three hour in-classroom session to get introverts and extroverts involved using a formal assessment in the front end, but I used an informal assessment in the beginning to help build out some of the content for the leadership program and to emphasize what I was gonna do in the classroom process, the um, third party supervisory skills course is constant. Can't change that, couldn't modify that. I can um, look at what's in there and what they said in the informal assessment process to match that up when I did the in-classroom session in the front end and the back end. It's about a $38,000 project for about a hundred supervisors. It's a great program that we put together, but we're using the informal assessment in the front end, we're using the formal assessment in the back end. Training needs assessments you normally have three proponents. You evaluate uh, in the beginning. You can collect all kinds of data. You can actually go into um, hiring and firing and layoffs, and you can go into a scrap and, and waste and different um, ideas of retention. You can actually look at all different kinds of data that you want to evaluate, collect that data, um, identify the success factors in there that's going to be associated with training. And then you're going to then propose and execute a training plan for them that would help the organization move past its issues of uh, retention, supervisory issues, HR issues, um, dealing with um, uh, required training and certifications that are necessary and how you're going to help them do that. So these are the normal three steps that you'd find in regards to setting up a training needs assessment. And then there's also an organizational assessment. So I've talked about informal assessment, talked about the formal assessment, which has to do with participants and students. This is talking about doing a training needs assessment for the organization and actually setting up a plan that you would have meetings with um, different groups. Um, you would do focus groups. You would collect information and data. You would derive outcomes of, of areas of improvement and what their key issues are and obstacles. And then you would actually help prepare training for either IT, um, policies and procedures, or dealing with the organizational effectiveness of uh, quality and quality improvement. And this is where we get into a training needs assessment. So we talked about three kinds of assessments right now, and there's also something called an organizational assessment. And that's really where you're getting involved with uh, almost interviewing everybody at the college in some formal or informal process using survey tools and collecting information from every person in the organization. So you have your formal and informal assessments for individuals. You have a training needs assessment for departments, areas, and areas of focus. And you have a training needs assessment and an organizational assessment uh, for the whole organization. I love talking about assessment because I just wanna make sure in the beginning, as we already heard from uh, one of our colleagues, they do this at different places and they've done it many times. That's fantastic. Um, and it's always amazing to ask for the permission to do that because when, this, when the customers engage with that process, they're showing full trust and confidence in you as the coordinator, you as the manager of the project. And um, I always make sure even in my proposal when I share that with a client that I let them know they're getting the value of the program manager, us as the college leaders, directors, deans, vice presidents, they get our support in putting a program initiative together. Plus they get an instructor that's an expert in the topic. So that's the differentiator between a consultant and us is that you're gonna get a program manager, you're gonna get a master instructor, and then you're gonna get the organizational certification that's backed by that, um, your community college or Santa Fe college in my case, uh, when I'm working with a client. I'm gonna let them know that in this six step process. Because what's gonna happen today as you and I meet we go through a consultation. You heard me go through these six steps before. There's a consultation where you meet one-on-one. -on -one. You probably need to be thinking about how many consultation sessions you want to do per week. Uh, we'll talk about appointments and goal setting and activities before we complete the session. 
Second thing is assessment. Where do we go from here? Formal assessment, informal assessment, training needs assessment, organizational assessment. Um, how can you engage yourself with that organization in the four quadrants I'll talk about um, in another slide? We're going to talk about how you put the training together, training development. So this is um, a skill set that I talk about. There's four great skill sets for us to have as deans, directors, or, or VPs. And one of them is knowing how to put together a training program, a little about training development, or the ADDI model, which many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, you can use the ADDI model as part of that strategy. Training begins, evaluation. We're gonna do a smile test with them. We're gonna do Kirkpatrick's four levels of evaluation. One of the things I'm gonna challenge you with at the end, if you aren't familiar with Dr. Kirkpatrick's four, value, four levels of evaluation, I can promise you that Sherm and ATD know all about that. And there's four levels of evaluation. Level one is the smile test. That's what we all do. We give them a piece of paper at the end. Uh, we ask them, did you like the food? Was the room too hot or cold? Did the instructor cover the objection objectives? Did you enjoy the class, yes or no? We're gonna get that smile test. Second level of Kirkpatrick's, uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick's evaluation is a, um, a, a pre-test, post-test. You're gonna basically test them in the beginning. You're gonna test them at the end to see if they've got the objectives down. Uh, the third one is managers' um, actual approval of the training and witnessing um, evaluation, evaluated uh, training difference in the behavior of the people or in the statistical results of their production at the other end of the process. That is done through a testimonial letter and about uh, two months or three months after the training is completed. You go back and ask for a testimonial letter from the supervisor or the manager or the buyer of the custom of the customized training. You've just done a third level evaluation. The fourth level is valuation is return on investment, where you measure scrap before and scrap after, and you, you measure retention before and retention after. It's usually a year long process for that to happen, to get to the tactical details that you need to have a, a ROI kind of investment. And very few organizations do go through that process, even though they talk about it all the time. And then follow up, what's your next step? How are you gonna meet with the students to find out how they did? Um, is there a list of next classes that they wanna offer and through the evaluation process? Do you need to meet with the supervisor in, in six months? Um, I like to ask the supervisor and send a, actually an email and that we've completed the process. Here's the evaluation from the students. I want the person that bought the training from us, the HR manager, the training manager, to get notice that we know the training is completed. Here's the evaluation. Um, and what's our next step if we need to think about a next step? Here's the four quadrants I talked about. We're gonna to try to provide training in these four areas, leadership, individual uh, employee skills, job specific skills and computer skills. So um, we can actually now then put our customers on the wall and see which quadrants we're providing training for that uh, organization in regards to their success. Job specific skills include certifications and credentialing and different strategies about their work. Uh, computer skills, obviously it can be soft skills and hard skills depending on the individual and the work that they're doing. Um, training for everybody, depending on requirements and what training is needed to do their job, and then leadership and supervisory skills. You can actually begin to start breaking your customers down at the end of the year. I'll put a list of our customers up and I'll start saying, okay, look, over at Google, who we're providing training for, we do three of the four quadrants. Uh, why aren't we doing job specific skills? Maybe that's something to upsell to. It's easier to upsell than it is to go find a new client. And so you're gonna think about why am I not doing that training for them? Uh, maybe there's a good reason, maybe they have their own computer instructor and they, um, though they don't need you to do that. Why, why are they choosing you for certain training, but uh, not for other quadrant areas? So Amazon doesn't use us for leadership and, and, super, and, and supervisory skills training, why is that? UPS doesn't use us for job specific skills, why is that? We can start questioning and looking at who's doing training where and maybe at Tesla, they have their own computer lab and their own computer instructor. That's okay to know, note in your CRM, as you're keeping tactical data inside your Aceware software, you're able to actually track who you got a contract with, when your last contract was. And then maybe there's notes uh, where you're able to even identify and talk about, uh, we, they have their own computer instructor in, in house. I'm gonna make sure they know though at Tesla that we can pick up that training. If that training manager leaves, if something happens and they need someone to fill in the gap for a period, 
we can bring somebody in to do that computer training for them. The same thing with GE, we don't do computer training for, but we do individual skills and job specific skills. This gives you a real visual of your clients, it gives you a real visual of what you're doing at each site. I like to make it visual and put it on the wall for my team and for me to cash, actually see them. Put your 25 hot clients on the wall. Look at whether you provide computer training skills for them, leadership, individual skills, or job specific skills. And then when you go back to meet with them, remember, you're going to meet with them and sell them the sales process, the system, the six-step process, consultation, assessment, evaluation of developing the training, training begins, evaluation, and follow-up. These six steps are going to be included in any time I do training at any of my customer sites to help them be successful. We do get a little confused between sales and marketing. I teach public relations academically. I teach marketing academically. And, and you have it right in your academic classes. The proponents of marketing uh, sales is just one piece of that. Um, your marketing plan should include advertising. Where are you going to advertise? Where are you going to pay for spots? What are you going to do to advertise your particular niche of service that you're doing? Not many of us have big advertising dollars. So this is really a difficult stretch for most customized training and continuing education divisions that I've worked with in my time um, and, and consulted with for years. Uh, advertising is a difficult thing for us. We have a great brand. College is a great brand. They might not have the right, remember in the beginning, psychology in their mind about the college providing training for them. Even leadership training, if there are people that have um, MBAs, they might not want a leadership certificate from a community college or just the college. They want it from a university sometimes. And so we have to overcome their minds of their experiences of working with different uh, facets of groups. So advertising, where are you gonna advertise? Publicity, what are you gonna do about publicity? What are you gonna create? Um, an event that actually costs money, an event that brings people together. I'm actually um, excited to say with you that I'm, I'm investing um, publicity money in the Society for Human Resource Managers. We want to have them actually hold their um, local SHRM chapter meeting at our uh, new conference center. I dreamed of this when I talked about uh, being there about 10 months ago. Um, we have a great place to uh, host that group. And it's taken me about 10 months to get on their schedule. Now they're coming. I'm going to have over 50 HR managers in front of me. I've also convinced them to have their, their regional um, meeting at our same facilities in October, which was gonna bring now 100 um, HR managers in front of us and at our facilities. So this is publicity, I'm gonna spend money. I'm actually gonna help them with um, providing a lunch and making their experience at our institution um, complimentary. And um, it's in the best interest of them, us, and our success. Public relations, how are you gonna write a press release? Um, um, fortunately, many press um, releases can come from your public relations department, they'll give you a form to fill out. If they don't give you a form, create a form. And it has to have the company name or the organization you're working with, what you did for them well, the key points and proponents that you want them to put in the public relations ad. Remember the, remember the testimonial letter I told you to get? Right, the testimonial letter, that's actually a Dr. Kirkpatrick's third level evaluation. That's actually part of the public relations initiative. You can tie that to publications and ask them to publish data out of that or comments from that cover customer that just gave you permission to, to share that information. You're also gonna use that testimonial letters when other customers ask who else has done this business. You're also gonna use that testimonial letter when you apply for a grant and they ask for examples of places you provided training and successfully did that in the past. You're gonna use those testimonial letters everywhere you go. That's a level three evaluation from Dr. Kirkpatrick. It's part of your public relations plan because the last thing we're gonna talk about is sales. So. This is really your sales plan. Um, nice question from Sharon just came up. And then the question is, are any of you collecting good testimonial letters? Hands up or notices in chat? Or is this a takeaway that you're, it's gonna be on your to-do now list? Yep. Yeah, no, this thing's good, Brenda. Brenda in Nebraska bad about pursuing those, Jody. It's a new goal. Very well, this nice. testi these testimonial letters are invaluable for your college. Number one, I've already collected in my 10 months at Santa Fe College over six testimonial letters. I've put them in slicks. I'm going to make sure the president of the college 
she has that on her desk. If somebody asks, what are you guys doing with business and industry? What are you doing for talent development and customized training? They're going to be able to pull those testimonial letters. Say, I'm glad you asked. I have a book here yeah, that, that has the testimonial letters in it. You're going to get that up the stream to your CEO or your president of your college. Secondly, your boss is going to have that. That's a dean or a provost or one of those magical words that we use in academics. They're going to have that. And you're going to have that too when you go on a sales call. Take your testimonial letters with you. It's called an evidence book. The evidence book is something that you have. It's actually a, a portfolio, what the academics call it. In 1992, I had evidence book from working with a corporate training initiative that I laid out in front of Finger Lakes Community College as a 28-year-old punk and said, look at this beautiful stuff uh, that I've done in corporate training. And one of the faculty members, very seasoned, looked at me and said, you have a portfolio. And I said, yes, that's what this is. It's a portfolio. It's a portfolio of your work. It's a portfolio of your college's experience working with corporate training. It's also a great testimonial to help people overcome uh, procrastination um, that you're the company or you're the college they want to provide the training with. They're going to see that other people have done it, and it's going to make them excited to do that. These um, different um, pieces are very easy and simple to use. I like the comment about white pages. Um, that's good, but that gets into great detail about your success stories that um, I think are amazing to write up, to share with other academics, and academics care about that. But corporate training needs to be shorter paragraphs or shorter little statements, um, maybe uh, all within one page white paper uh, that they can see some graphs, charts, and statistics because you're going to appeal to both, remember the dominant, influential, conscientious, and steadiness around DISC. You have to think about that when you go into the sales mode. Remember I told you there were four steps, opening, questioning, evidence, and next step. This is the evidence part where you show the testimonial letters in the sales process. So let's, let's talk about sales and, and who the customer is. I'll brief through this quickly because there are four people that you want to have on your email list on your social media list, on your mailing list, and mailing still isn't dead, um, depending on what you're trying to get out in the message to your customer. I always like to ask this question, who's your customer? And whenever I meet with community colleges across the country, they say, everybody in my district, all the people. And the answer is, no, they're not. There's actually four important people that you're trying to, to narrow in on um, in your area, and that is uh, training and development managers, talent development people. You're trying to find them, create a list of 50 to 75 that you can communicate with on a consistent basis. You're trying to find a human resource manager. HR manager makes some decisions different than that maybe the training manager. Depending on the size of the organization, there might only be one of these people anyway. Uh, 500 or less employees is going to be the HR and training manager, as well as the um, hiring and firing and also discipline uh, person. Their jobs are really tough. They're looking for a very confident person to come in and take over. The IT manager makes decisions outside of HR and training management. They tell them what they need because that's just too technical today now for HR and training managers to be involved. And the last one is a CEO list. You have four different lists. Every company you work with, you should have these three or four lane uh, people uh, with their emails and their, their communications in your database, in your Aceware software so that you can contact them on a consistent basis. Let me tell you who is contacting each one of these um, people on a consistent basis. Consultants, training people, um, outside third-party vendors. They're constantly sending them emails and communications. And when it hits, it hits. And that's when they're going to use it the most. You need to be scheduled. You know, probably like any HR training manager need to be getting like five copies of your schedule electronically or on paper and um, especially in paper, so they can hand it off to some supervisor that says, I have a problem with, this, with a client or a customer or, or a participant. They can say, here's the, here's, the, here's the supervisory skills coming up at the local college. Why don't you enroll in that? That would be a one-off that they can do. You're upselling open enrollment to um, hopefully corporate training initiatives as well. So these are some of the ideas that you want to think about. These are the four people that you want to chase down and make sure that you're in your database. Define your customer. You're, there's, there's three levels. I like to talk about partners, clients, and prospects. So you're going to do different things for each one of those. A partner, you actually create 
a whole identity for that partner. A partner maybe spends $5,000 with you per year. They maybe employ um, over 100 people. They're in a certain industry cluster that you recognize as economic development. There's, there's some strategies you build about a partner group. Remember, there's four titles we talked about, the one on our mailing list, our emailing list, our social media list. Well, these partners might be 50 or 75 companies. That's realistic for you to go meet with on a yearly basis, on maybe um, a strategy of a face-to-face -face contact or a, a, a tele-meeting with a conferencing video like Zoom. You want to get face to face with them and keep building confidence. You got to schedule meetings with them. You got to follow up with them and 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 get to get to know them well. Clients um, are individuals that come back every other year. There are certain people we know that do supervisory skills every other year with us, or they upgrade their um, operating system. They do computer training with us. They only come in that moment of crisis. A lot of the clients are even grant funded people. They want that fifty percent off and the economic development group. They're just not partners that provide training and a training plan for a year-long strategy. And you can depend on that revenue every year for a $10,000 contract or a $30,000 contract. That's my goal is to get partners where we're providing the four quadrants for them and that I give them actually their own scheduled training book. They actually have their logo on the front, my logo on the front. They open up the front page. It's the CEO saying training is important to us. The first page is computer training. Second page is leadership training. The third page is industry certifications and credentials. And it's a training that we're either providing in-house with them or through third-party vendors. Prospects are those other individuals that we're serving the rest of the community. We're going to do some kind of blast, some kind of social media, some kind of event. Now, keep in mind that we're trying to think about our customers from this perspective. A target audience, we're trying to find out how we're going to you know, communicate and how we're going to have frequency for contact with them. You actually have to build a communications plan. I'm going to make sure I email them once a month. I'm going to make sure that I meet with them twice a year. I'm going to make sure that I um, help them with a grant initiative once or twice a year. You have to build out a communications plan. The weakest thing that we have in our customized training divisions, our talent development groups is planning. We aren't planning these events. We aren't are taking our customers and building a target list and trying to make sure that we meet with them face to face and building frequency of contacts because that's what's going to make a difference in your example. The example of an annual communications plan could look like this. And the, this is what we're going to do for our partners. We're going to make sure they get the electronic newsletter. We're going to make sure we have provided a lunch and learn for them or an event. We're going to mail and email them. We're going to find a way to have a webinar for them. We're going to do certain things for our partners on a regular basis that, we've, that we don't do for clients and prospects. We're gonna make sure that our partners get communicated with regularly. Then we're gonna take our clients and we're gonna to try to be moving them to partner status. We're gonna find a way to contact with them once or twice a year, how we're gonna have quarterly blasts, how we're gonna do a webinar initiative for them. And keep in mind what we're doing for these clients and partners, we can splash that out to the prospects anytime with public relations or publicity events to invite them to be part of the partner client group and bring them into the fold over a period of time. So you have to build a plan you have to be able to take your customers, put them in a profile and identify who they are and build that out. Once you do that, this is where the sales process comes into play. You have an open, I mentioned that to you before. You have a questioning stage where you ask questions. This is the most dangerous part of the sales. They're gonna to say to you, go ahead and tell me what you do. Even if it's a follow-up call and your answer is, can't wait to tell you about the changes at the college, new opportunities. But before I do that, let me ask you some questions. What's currently going on right now? What's your hiring status? What are you looking for in technology changes? Um, what, what does it mean when you say you're downsizing or you're hiring new people? Remember in the evidence stage, testimonial letters, key evidence book that you create, which is your own profile about you. You'll use it in your next interview. When you go to interview somewhere, you're gonna use your evidence book and you're gonna have a, a, a portfolio of your work and be able to share that. I've been able to do that everywhere I've gone. Um, I've created um, actually training needs assessments and organizational assessments for the state of Wisconsin. Um, we, we then went through Wisconsin. This is probably over 12 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, but I do still have the guide, the guide and binder that I built for Wisconsin. And we went out to each community college and actually showed them how to implement a training needs assessment and also an individual informal assessment process. That's a tool that I would use um, during this time for evidence to show somebody good work and next step, we're not selling anything that's 
a, a vacuum cleaner we're dropping off today. We've got to come back and talk about what are the next steps? Do we do an informal assessment? Did they allow you permission to do that? Did they allow you to give them a proposal and move forward to the next proposal stage? Um, did they allow you to go through the next step process where you actually say to them, would you see this training at your site or our, our site? Would you like this training to begin in the day or the evening? Approximately how many people do you want in this? When you're going through that questioning flow and the next step process, those are great buying signals to tell you the customer is very, very serious about your work. In closing here, I want you to think about a calls per week. You gotta know how many appointments you're gonna make. If your goal is one a week, you'll, you'll miss weeks. You'll, you'll only meet with about three people a month, two people a month. I believe in our business, even though we do operations, sales, uh, we do our client work, we do the proposals and the contracts, that we need a minimum of three appointments per week. Three appointments face-to-face, -face, three appointments on webinars, three appointments in a, uh, on a face-to-face on -face event using technology, uh, company meetings, um, how many companies are you gonna meet with each year? Identify that number. What events are you gonna do? A healthcare event, a manufacturing event, a biotech event, um, uh, an educational event, a government event. Whatever event it is you're gonna do, you're gonna create a, a certain number of those. I think you need quarterly um, as each individual in your sales team is working to create a, an event each quarter. That could be as, you know, as many as 10 people in this little event. Um, or a symposium of, of 50 or 75 people that you introduce yourself to in your community. Um, when you think about writing contracts, um, contracts is what we do. We call it contract training at a lot of colleges because we write a contract to do the training. Really, it's customized training. It's talent development. We do build out contracts, and I'll talk about that um, prospecting. How many appointments are you going to make? What else are you going to do for mailings, emailings, uh, social media? How are you going to use social media? Product knowledge is key, uh, making sure you know a little bit about what the current training issues and the questions to ask. And then team sales, where you actually team up with each other to, to think about how you build out your social media plan. There's so many tactical things you can do. Today, I just shared with you a few of the, the ideas about thinking about um, being successful in, in sales. I can go into a lot, a lot more details. Actually, this is almost a two-day uh, course uh, that I provide or a one-day session on a very regular basis that we, um, we work with. I think your tactical details are important. I was gonna close with you by looking at um, uh, thinking about um, tactical information at the end. You wanna be able to have a, a CRM that tracks your data, that tells you where your clients are and what you're doing. Um, you wanna think about um, information that you're collecting. How are you being able to collect your information around data and information? Um, to keep in mind that people want to know about completers, job tracking, did they successfully get what they do? Those are part of the keys in your CRM that's with Aceware. You can actually keep track of who the customers you met with them, what you're doing on a regular basis. If it's your open enrollment and continuing education initiative, you're trying to find out did they get a job in their field of study. That's tracking process. You can find all kinds of details about that and different tools that exist out there and thinking about helping them in their next process. Um, I'm gonna stop there, Sharon, for 